Did you ever go to summer camp? I mean, like, Camp Crystal Lake type of summer camp. Cabins in the woods, a big pond or lake with lots of nature noises, and barely legal teenagers entrusted with the health and safety of a few dozen kids, away from home, maybe, for the first time in their young lives. Our story today is about a camp like this. But sadly, this camp's summer campers did not even make it through one night away from home. I'm John Dodson, and today on The Secret Sits, we are going to talk about the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. Camp Scott opened in 1928 for girls from 10 to 18 years of age, and it was located a few miles south of Locust Grove, Oklahoma. In 1977, it was being run by the Magic Empire Girl Scout Council and had grown to include 10 campsites, a great hall, and a swimming pool. Situated within 410 acres on the left bank of Snake Creek, each campsite was placed near the main thoroughfare, known as the Cookie Trail. The sites were given Native American tribe names and consisted of canvas tents placed on wooden platforms, roughly set around a stone-encircled campfire, with enough room for four kids to share each tent. Now, if you look at pictures of the campsite, you may see some of these platforms with full cabins. Those are not what we're talking about here. The campers' tents were literally wooden platform bases with a canvas tent built on top of it. The girls would find themselves new friends within their tribe, safely overseen by counselors who would have their own tent. The layout of the camp meant that the tents were not evenly spaced, nor were the campsites placed equally along the cookie trail. On June 12, 1977, around 140 Girl Scouts departed from the Magic Empire Council building in Tulsa, Oklahoma, heading to Camp Scott. The girls would arrive at camp for a two-week period. The camp counselors would then stay on as a new set of girls would show up for the next two weeks. Carlo Wilhite, 18, Susan Ewing, also 18, and D. Elder, 20, were assigned as counselors to Kiowa Camp and asked to look after 27 children. As the girls arrived at the camp, they were allowed to select their own tent mates. The three youngest girls at camp were Lori Lee Farmer, who was eight, Michelle Heather Gousset, who was nine, and Doris Denise Milner, ten. And they all picked each other to be tent mates. There was supposed to be a fourth girl in their tent for the night, but for some reason this girl slept in a different tent on the first night, which most likely saved her young life. Kiowa Camp happened to be set furthest west and was more isolated away from the trail than the others. This happened to be where the three youngest girls would be placed on this first rotation of campers. Lori, Michelle, and Denise were given Tent 7. Within Kiowa Camp, Tent 7 was slightly further apart from the other tents and the view from the counselor's tent was obscured by the shower block. Now, I do want to point out one discrepancy if you are researching this case. Technically, the camp only had seven cabins because the counselor's tent is not counted in the numbered cabins. However, you may find a lot of articles saying that the girls were in cabin seven or cabin eight. This is simply if the people are counting the cabins in total or if they're going off the official cabin numbers. For the sake of clarity here, we will call this Cabin 7, its official number, at Camp Scott. A thunderstorm hit the area that night, just after the girls 
had had their dinner in the mess hall. So the girls spent time in their tents, writing letters back home and chatting between themselves before they went to sleep. I want to get into who these girls were just a bit here. Lori Lee Farmer is eight years old, and she is the youngest girl at camp this week. She is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and her father is a doctor. She was a very bright little girl who was said could recite the Pledge of Allegiance at just 16 months old. She had also skipped the second grade. Lori's mother, Sherry, said that Lori wasn't sure if she wanted to go to the Girl Scout camp or a different YMCA camp. Lori just couldn't decide, so she asked her mother to pick for her. Lori's mother picked this camp and this camp session for her daughter to attend, a decision which I am sure haunts her to this day. Lori's letter to her mother, written on this rainy night at camp, said, Dear Mom and Dad and Misty and Joe and Chad and Kathy, which were her siblings, we are just getting ready to go to bed. It is 7.45. We are at the beginning of a storm and having a lot of fun. I've met two new friends, Michelle Gousset and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. It started raining on the way back from dinner. We are sleeping on cots. I couldn't wait to write. We are all writing letters now because there isn't anything else to do. With love, Lori. Heather Michelle Gousset was from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and she was nine years old. She was also quite intelligent. She loved to read, and she was close to her older brother Mike, who was 13. She was known to be a shy girl, but she loved playing soccer, and she loved participating in the Girl Scouts. The letter Michelle chose to write was to her Aunt Karen. And she wrote, Dear Aunt Karen, how are you? I'm fine. I'm writing from camp. We can't go outside because it is storming. Me and my tent mates are in the last tent in our unit. My tent mates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmer. My room is in shades of purple. Love, Michelle. Michelle had attended Camp Scott the previous summer. Denise Milner was the oldest of the three girls at 10 years old. She is also from Tulsa. Her mother, Betty, has never visited Denise's grave because she feels an overwhelming guilt over her daughter's death. Denise was one of the kindest girls you would have ever met, according to her school teachers and her principal. She had a five-year-old sister at this time, who she was upset to leave when she had to leave for camp. She saved up to go to this camp by selling, of course, Girl Scout cookies. Her plan had been to attend the camp with some of her best friends, but at the last minute, her friends backed out of the trip. Because of this last minute change, Denise had reservations about going to camp at all. Her mom, however, convinced her daughter to go to camp and at least give it a try. She wanted her to try to become more independent, but her mother promised her that if she was scared or didn't like it, all she had to do was call her, and they would come and pick her up. Now, if you are not ready, get ready, because Denise's letter is tough to read. She wrote, Dear Mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day, it rained. I have three new friends, though, named Glinda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Casey and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. Now when the girls were loaded onto the buses to head off to camp, Denise had a little breakdown, and this is to be expected for small kids setting off for camp. 
and possibly their first time away from home. But a counselor named Michelle Hoffman approached Denise and her mother, and she told her mother that she would take care of her, and she even sat next to her on the bus the entire ride to camp. But before the buses had left, Denise's mom got onto the bus and said to Michelle Hoffman, Please make sure that if Denise wants to call me, that she can call me. To which Michelle agreed. At some time before 10 p.m. on June 12, 1977, one of the counselors of the Comanche camp saw a light in the forest moving north towards Kiowa camp, but she was not sure what it was. The Comanche camp was the next camp complex over from Kiowa. At the Kiowa camp, around 10 p.m., D. Elder made a tent check of Kiowa subcamp and satisfied herself that everything was fine. During this time, D. Elder spoke to Denise Milner, who asked to call home. But D. talked to the girl until she had calmed down and she convinced her that everything was fine and that she could call her mother the next morning. Lights out for the night came between 10 and 10.30 p.m. Two hours later, around midnight, Carla Wilhite escorted some of the girls from the toilets back to their tents. The girls in Tent 5 were warned by Carla to stop making noise at 1.30 a.m. And at the same time, she heard a strange noise coming from the woods just behind the tents. It was described as a low, guttural sound, but she was not sure whether it was an animal or a human. When she pointed her flashlight in the direction of the noise, it stopped. She then returned to her tent to sleep, but she continued to hear the noise intermittently. She also reported seeing a dim light out in the woods. Around 3 a.m., there were two reports of girls and other camps being awoken by noises. One report is of a single scream, which may have happened earlier, around 1 a.m., and the other is of a girl crying out for her mother. Campers from some of the neighboring camps also reported seeing the dim light out in the woods. Around the same time, someone was moving through Kiowa camp, reaching into tents and stealing items such as purses and several pairs of prescription eyeglasses. The last story from a surviving witness is from the girls in Tent 6, who said that their tent flap was pulled back and a man shone a light into the tent. After a few seconds, the flap was replaced and he moved on toward Tent 7. Carla Wilhite's alarm went off at 6 a.m. so that she could shower before her girls woke up. She headed east toward Guapa Camp and the staff house. As she did so, she spotted something at the fork of the trail. Initially thinking someone had dropped some of their gear, she walked over to investigate. As she approached the bundles, she could tell that what she was seeing was sleeping bags. And then suddenly, she could see the body of a girl lying next to them, face up and naked from the waist down. It was the body of 10-year-old Denise Milner. Her hands were bound behind her back with tape and cord. She had been strangled, also with cord, which was still around the young child's neck. She had also suffered bludgeoning around her face and head. After realizing she had discovered a body, Carla immediately woke Dee and Susan to help her with the check on the other children. Dee starts by checking Tent 7, where she quickly discovers that all three children were missing. Carla headed for the nurse's station, and as the nurse drives up to Kiowa Camp, Carla heads to the director's house to inform camp director Barbara Day and her husband Richard of what they had found. Upon arriving at the body, 
The nurse checked for any signs of life, but it was clear that Denise Milner was dead. Richard Day, Barbara's husband, arrived on the scene and he attempted to move one of the other sleeping bags. And he discovered the bodies of the other two girls were inside of the sleeping bags. Later, these would be confirmed as being Lori Farmer and Michelle Gousset. He also placed another sleeping bag over the naked lower half of Denise. Richard said he just tried to preserve her dignity. Barbara Day calls Highway Patrol officer Harold Barry. They discover that both of the other girls, Lori and Michelle, had also been killed by blunt force trauma to the backs of their heads. By 8 a.m. on the 13th of June, Sheriff Glenn Pete Weaver knew he would need the assistance of a larger force and requested help from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Earlier, in April of 1977, during an on-site training session, a camp counselor discovered that her belongings had been ransacked and her donuts had been stolen. Inside the empty donut box was a disturbing handwritten note stating in capital letters, We are on a mission to kill three girls, intent one. The director of that camp session treated the note as a prank, and it was discarded. Highway Patrol Officer Harold Barry was the first law enforcement officer on the scene and found one set of boot prints leading from Kiowa Camp to the spot where the bodies were discovered. The general scene was not secured until much later. It appeared that the killer had approached from the rear of Tent 7 and unhooked the back flaps to gain entry. Investigators believe that Lori and Michelle were both bludgeoned to death inside of the tent, judging by blood spatter on the canvas walls and wooden floor. They were also both sexually assaulted, police believe. However, Lori's tests were inconclusive, so there is a chance that she was killed first and not sexually assaulted. The killer tried to clean up the blood using bed sheets, but one single boot print was left behind, a size nine and a half. No fingerprints were found inside of the tent. Denise Milner had been taken out of the cabin alive. She had been bound and her mouth stuffed with a pre-made gag before being walked over to the area where the bodies were eventually found. She was sexually assaulted, bludgeoned, and strangled to death. And just so you are clear, and in case you have not already looked up a map of this campsite, Denise had to have been walked right past the counselor's tent based on where the bodies were found. The attacks had definitely been planned in advance. The gag on Denise was pre-sewn and the killer had also brought along nylon rope and duct tape for binding the victims. Semen was found on each body and a red flashlight was found next to them. A hair caught in the duct tape that did not belong to any of the girls was also located. The autopsy found that the weapons used were held in both the left and right hands. It was also evident that more than one weapon was used in the bludgeoning, and two different knots had been used in tying the girls. Were these signs of a second killer? The weapons themselves were never found. The rope and tape had recently been stolen from a farm a mile from Camp Scott. The farmer, Jack Schroff, had an alibi and also passed a voluntary lie detector test. A fingerprint was found on the lens of the flashlight near the tent, but it was never identified. And also, just quickly about this flashlight, this was one of those old-school 6-volt flashlights that held one huge battery. The police also discovered that there was a pinhole cut into the lens of the flashlight. 
The purpose of this hole would be to make the flashlight much dimmer, maybe like the dim light that was seen in the woods behind the tents. They also discovered that there was a wad of newspaper in the flashlight to make sure that the battery did not jiggle around and make noise. When the camp administration contacted the parents to pick up their children, they were told that there had been an accident at the camp and a couple of children had died. And this included the parents of the three slain girls. For all their parents knew, they had died in a random camping accident. The OSBI quickly eliminated all obvious males as suspects, including Richard Day, Jack Schroff, and camp ranger Ben Woodward. Jean Leroy Hart, who was 34 at the time of the murders, had been at large since 1973, after escaping from the Mays County Jail. Hart was raised about a mile from Camp Scott and was a Native American Cherokee. In 1966, he abducted two pregnant women from outside of a nightclub, drove to a forest on the outskirts of Locust Grove, and raped them. He had been convicted of the kidnapping and the rape of the two women, as well as four counts of first-degree burglary. The women were bound with duct tape and rope. After the rapes in an apparent attempt to murder them, he closed off their noses and mouths with duct tape and left them to die in the woods. Fortunately, the women managed to untie themselves and find help. They described Hart as being incoherent during the rape and that he made strange, growling noises a possible link to the strange noises on the night of the murder of the young girls in Tent 7. In 1973, Hart escaped by sawing through the bars to his cell window. He was eventually recaptured, and he was known to have committed three burglaries in total, and in each case the victims were asleep in their houses at the time. Hart eventually admitted to both the rapes and burglaries and was sentenced to a total of 305 years as he had tried to evade the first trial, attempted to kill his rape victims, and committed further crimes while on parole. But the fact that Hart had escaped May's jail and evaded Sheriff Glenn Pete Weaver led many to believe there was a personal vendetta driving the manhunt. It was suspected that many in the Cherokee community were helping Hart to evade capture. At the time of the manhunt, Angie Jake, editor of the Tulsa Indian News, said, Hart pulled the wool over their eyes for so long and he frustrated them. So when his name popped up, they blamed it on him. Ross Swimmer, Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation in 1977 said, These people were acting emotionally, simply trying to help out a fellow Cherokee. And let me just say this really quick. I used to work at a theater on the Cherokee Indian Reservation in North Carolina, and I made a lot of friends who were Cherokee, and they are an amazing people. They are bold, they are loving, and they can be the most loyal friends you may ever make. So the talk of other Cherokee helping Hart does not surprise me at all, especially because they thought he was being framed. Fears grew that Hart was being framed as rumors began that the OSBI were planting evidence to convict him. It was also leaked to the press that sperm was found in the semen evidence, but Hart was known to have had a vasectomy. Not all Cherokee felt the same. OSBI agents Larry Bowles and Harvey Pratt were both from the same tribe, and they received help from a respected medicine man named Crying Wolf. It was certainly a challenging time for relations between the different peoples of Oklahoma. 
Tracker dogs were brought in after the bodies were discovered in Camp Scott, but they found no scent trail. The forest was so dense in parts that it was not uncommon for some of the 600 searchers to become lost on occasion themselves. In the mountain overlooking Camp Scott, OSBI agent Arthur Linville found a cave with some unusual items, including red underwear, a picture of two women which looked like a wedding photo, and a newspaper were found along with a pair of glasses that belonged to a Camp Scott counselor. Remember the person who had been stealing from the camp had taken several pairs of prescription glasses. A further link to the camp was made when it was discovered that part of the newspaper had been torn out and it matched some of the newspaper found inside of the red flashlight at the crime scene. The picture from the cave was made public and a prison officer recognized the women in it from a part-time job as a wedding photographer. As part of a photography course in prison, Jean Leroy Hart had helped develop the photos. It also emerged that the cave and Camp Scott were within walking distance of Hart's mother's home. Two weeks after the murders, a farmer reported that he'd seen Jean Hart on a hillside. On further investigation, Agent Harvey Pratt found a formation of four fires and cigarette butts. As a Cherokee himself, Pratt recognized the formation, the cedar wood used, and the fact that the cigarette filters were torn off as an indication of a Native American smoke ritual. The butts tested positive for the same O-type blood as Hart. A boot print was also found that matched the size of the blood print in Tint 7, but Jean Leroy Hart had size 11 feet. Then, another cave was found, around one mile from the camp, on the land of Jack Schroff. A prisoner told police about its existence, claiming he had met Hart there after the murders. This prisoner was 16 years old at the time, and would later be convicted of killing his own three-year-old son. It does not appear that the OSBI pursued this information as a suspect in the Girl Scout murders. A message was written on the cave wall. The unusual date format is said to be used by both the military and the prison system, with the year appearing before the month and day. Due to the size of Camp Scott, it was hard for law enforcement to secure it while they searched for evidence. In the weeks after the murders, a security company was employed to guard the camp, which had now been emptied of all staff. According to the security guards, there was evidence that someone was still stalking the camp, leaving footprints in fresh sand and leaving doors open that had previously been shut. They also spoke of seeing silhouettes in the dense woods on multiple occasions, and sometimes dogs were used to try and track whoever was out there. One time, a dog returned to the tracker and had seemed to have been struck. The guards began leaving threads tied between trees to see which paths the intruders were using, and they would find them broken on further investigations. One day, the security guards returned to the Great Hall, which they used as an office, when they found a bag had been left by the door. This bag contained pink socks and a pair of tennis shoes with the name Denise Milner written inside. Both the socks and shoes were wet. Tom Kennedy, deputy director of the OSBI at the time, said that two pairs of shoes were already in evidence lockers. He believed those found by the security guards were to be viewed as separate pieces of evidence, but nothing came of this lead. After 10 months on the manhunt, Agent Larry Bowles had been working with an informant in the Cherokee community and discovered that Hart 
was hiding out with a friend called Sam Pigeon, 50 miles east of Camp Scott. Pigeon was convinced of Hart's innocence and had let him live in his three-room shack for the previous eight months. On April 6th of 1978, eight OSBI officers surrounded the shack and arrested Hart. Bowles stated that as he cuffed Hart, he asked, You killed those little girls, didn't you? Hart's reply was apparently, You'll never pin it on me. When Hart was arrested, he was wearing a pair of women's eyeglasses. Again, with the glasses. On the initial search of Pigeon's shack, they found nothing of significance. However, when they came back and searched it again a few days later, they found two items of interest, a toy corncob pipe and a small mirror. These two items had supposedly been reported as stolen from one of the counselors at the camp, and they had been stolen the night of the murders. These items conveniently tied Hart to the campgrounds. Hart was tried in March of 1979, and he was represented by Larry Oliver from Tulsa, Oklahoma. His supporters defended him so aggressively that the victims' families needed police escorts in the courthouse to keep them from harm. The district attorney, Sid Wise, was also caught making deals to sell the story's rights before the trial had even began, so he was recused from the case. The Cherokee Nation donated $12,000 to Hart's legal funds, and they did not do this in an attempt to defend Hart. They just felt that even if he was guilty, he deserved to have a fair trial with a court-appointed attorney that was not going to happen. The defense team carefully dismantled the prosecution's case. Remember the corncob pipe and the mirror that were recovered on the secondary search of the shack? Well, it turns out that the counselor who owned these items testified that they were in a trunk that she had brought with her to camp, and that this trunk was taken into evidence by the police and when the trunk was returned to her, those items were suddenly gone. Interesting. The bloody footprint in the tent was too small to be hearts. The fingerprint on the flashlight was not a match. The semen swabs taken from the girls were not conclusive. They were proven to be from a non-white male, so possibly a Cherokee, and the blood type was O. But the fact that sperm was found caused reasonable doubt as well, because Hart had had a vasectomy. The prosecution had Hart tested, and they proved that his vasectomy did not fully take and that he could produce sperm. But once again, the defense rebuffed this with the fact that because of the botched vasectomy, Hart's sperm were majorly disformed. It was claimed that the hair was Hart's, but this also could not be proven. And they claimed evidence was being planted to frame Hart, partly motivated by racial bias. After hearing the evidence, the jury took only six hours to deliberate. They found Hart not guilty of the murders. Although the local sheriff pronounced himself 1,000% certain that Hart was guilty. The jury acquitted him, clearly believing that he had been framed for the murders because of his Cherokee roots. As a convicted rapist and jail escapee, he still had 305 years of his sentence left to serve in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. On June 4, 1979, Hart collapsed and died of a heart attack. After about an hour of lifting weights and jogging in the prison exercise yard, two of the families later sued the Magic Empire Council and its insurer for $5 million, alleging negligence. 
The civil trial included discussion of the threatening note and the fact that tent 7 was 86 yards from the counselor's tent. In 1985, by a 9-3 to vote, jurors decided in favor of Magic Empire. After all of this, OSBI continued to test the evidence from this case as technology improved. DNA testing conducted in 1989 showed three of the five probes matched Hart's DNA. Statistically, DNA from one in 7,700 Native Americans would also obtain these results. In 2008, authorities conducted new DNA testing on stains found on a pillowcase, the results of which proved inconclusive because the samples were too deteriorated to obtain a DNA profile. For these tests, OSBI officials tried to use a semen-stained pillow that had been retrieved from the crime scene. The semen was suspected to have been hearts. FBI tests on samples from the same pillowcase in 1989 were inconclusive. OSBI spokesman Chuck Jeffries said the recent efforts to extract DNA from the pillowcase were not successful. The samples tested were insufficient and too deteriorated. There is no DNA to test. The lab tried to obtain but could not come up with anything to test, said Jeffries. The polyamorous chain reaction short tandem repeat test that was used represents state-of-the-art forensic technology and had a good track record with old, deteriorated evidence. Investigators were able to retrieve what OSBI spokeswoman Kim Koch described as a partial DNA profile from a female. But we do not know which female, said Koch. The information was partial and not sufficient for comparison to the girls. No results. We got nothing, said Koch. S.M. Buddy Fallis Jr., the former Tulsa County District Attorney who prosecuted the case, was not discouraged. He said, It would be nice if they could have gone and had a full result in order to resolve any doubt that some people might have had but it certainly doesn't change my belief as to Hart's guilt and does not support any belief that he was not the person. Michelle Gousset's father, Richard, helped the legislature pass the Oklahoma Crime Victims' Bill of Rights. This bill helps victims' families obtain rights that were not afforded to the families during this case. Victims' families can now be kept informed about the procedures of their cases. They now have to be placed in waiting rooms where they will not be encountered by the suspect nor their family, and many other changes. And these may seem like small things, but when a family is going through possibly the worst time in their lives, these little things matter. This case remains unsolved to this day, even if some are convinced that they know who did it. But then again, that's the thing about the public and secrets. We dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. I'm John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Leigh.